Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, Alan, who do we have? Aldo Nova. Hey, incredible. <laughs> the life and times of Eddie Gage, the exciting new rock opera by Aldo Nova. Alan, since 2008. Can you believe that? Oh, 12 years I worked on it. And now I'm writing the, uh, like the uh, sort of libretto and stuff like that. And last night I was working on it and I added a new character and that put everything together. <laughs> so, uh, there you go. So last night it was finished, finally, you know what I mean? So uh, it was really uh, it was an emotional moment that after 12 years. You know, it wasn't just the music. It's because I'm writing the whole story. So... Uh, it's just like when I finally hit that last character that I added in, just put everything together, and uh, it was it. And everything fit. It was like actually a real rock opera, so it was great. And, I, and again, like Avantasia to buy a Samus, he has all these different singers he writes for. You're doing all the voices for all the parts. Exactly. I wow. Think I, I, uh, have you heard any of it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. We heard a little bit. Yeah, We heard a little bit. I mean, to me, it's like Prague. It's, it's like a prog album. It's, and and I'm, I'm a huge like Rush fan, Yes fan, you know, uh, Uri Heap, Kansas, you know, those prog bands. And that's what it kind of, to me, it, that's the direction you're heading in or it's, you're in. I mean, uh, it's not, I mean, it's got super rock songs. It's got like techno songs. It's got a 40 piece orchestra with a voice. It's got a heavy duty rock song, you know. I mean, there's a Hey Lowdy Daddy, which is heavy. There's Crawl, which is, almost synth pop. There's uh, King of the Sea, which is like 40 piece orchestra with just my voice. It's got, uh, when all is said that, this is the five song demo that I sent you. Uh, it's got when all is said done, which is super heavy rip. Yeah. And there's, uh, you know, Say a Little Prayer, which has got gospel and rock and rap. So it's a mix of everything. So every yeah. song is different. You know? Yeah, but you know what? Saying that, everything sounds like you. Like, you know, you have a distinct style. Goes back right from right from the very beginning. Oh, there that we go, on vinyl, eh? Everybody, everybody. On vinyl. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Where's that Hanson guy? <laughs> you, know, you know what's amazing? Aldo, I'm just going to just change here. Look how young you are here. I can't even believe how young you are. Oh, I mean, yeah. Look at this. Look at, actually, I haven't changed that much. Look at that. Look at that young guy. Yeah, yeah, you have the reissue because they don't have that in a real album. I do have the reissue. You're right, I do. Yeah, because yeah, it, yeah. Like, and that that record sounds like crap. The remastered one. I mean, I don't know who I don't know who remastered it, but it must have been Helen, Helen Keller because <laughs> it sounds, it sounds like crap. I mean, the sleep credits are bad. It's just the rock candy issue is like, do not buy. Try to get like uh, something on eBay or whatever because. Uh, something that was an original mastering by Bob Ludwig, who masters all my stuff. I mean, the Bob album, like the first album, actually sounded like a ton of bricks. But this rock candy issue is like, stay away from it. It's like really not good. But I mean, but, this album, when it came out, it was huge. This was on the radio every day. You couldn't go anywhere without hitting Fantasy or Ball and Chain. Or, uh, it, and, you know, and, and I call it, it was Bon Jovi before Bon Jovi. You know what I mean? Yeah. Actually, balls and chain, ball and chain. Uh, during my divorce, I called it balls and pain. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> fooling yourself. I mean, there's just one hit after another. This was your debut album. Fooling yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, that album is like now considered like uh, with the Boston albums and all the like the the, the high infidelity from Mario's. It's like you know considered like a classic. So. I mean, fantasy is a classic. No, I mean, you, you can't go into a club without seeing the cover band playing that song. So then you know yeah. you've got something that lasted. And, you know, I, I got back into, uh, uh, I, did, I did all the Reboot album on 2.0. Yeah. Uh, Wait one? a second. Here we are. Here we are. Oh, 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 there's a surprise. There it is. There it is. Look at this. The 2.0, what it was, it was like a reboot. And, but that was creativity in another sense. It may not have been like original writing, but that to arrange those songs and make them sound uh, new. Again, that was a lot of work, but I knew that 2.0 was just a stepping stone to putting out my Eddie Gage album. And that was, yeah. when, when I was, uh, when I did 2.0, I got excited about music again. I got excited about playing guitar. 
I got excited about composing and doing arranging, uh, mixing and stuff like that. And I hadn't, for a long time, I hadn't picked up a guitar and I hadn't, uh, you know, I just thought it's completely interested in music, you know. I, you know, I was, I was just learning how to program, learning how to mix, doing all the technical side of it. But I mean, as far as like playing. So when I did 2.0, that actually got me, uh, gave me a heart out for playing music again. I mean, to put it uh, in another way. So, you know, so um, that was it. But now, you know, some people always come to me when I'm at the in-laws or something like that. And they put on fantasy, like the first album. And I realized from hearing it that that was really revolutionary. And it sounds amazing even today. I mean, the, it's yeah. bombastic. I mean, the sound is incredible. You know, so. you know what I loved about that song? And I think what and I, I'm sure you I know this, it took new wave and it took hard rock and it just, it just came together. And, and, and that's why it sounds so great because it's got those, uh, the keyboards of the new wave era at the time and hard rock. It's like April wine meets, I don't know, men without hats. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just it, the sound. You, you were like the first to, you know how they used to hide the keyboard player in the back and just have a little bit of keyboards. Well, you brought it up front, hard rock with up front keyboards. Funny story though, you know what? That re the record that, that uh, when I did Fantasy, before Fantasy, I was doing New Wave, like Gary Newman, uh, because this guy had hired me to be like his ghostwriter. He was like, had a record deal and uh, but didn't, have, didn't know how to sing, didn't know how to play. So he came to me in, in my uh, club days and he said, do you know how to sing and write? And I said, yeah. So uh, he like, gave me studio time and I started to write New Wave, like really New Wave stuff that was popular. And uh, then I had done a demo of that. And so people got excited about that. And then I had half a record of New Wave and half the record that had Fantasy, Ball and Chain, stuff like that. So I went into a, a Canadian record label called Solid Gold. I don't know if you're aware of it. And they said, well, you've got, you know, you've got half an album here. One, one is great and the other half is just like, so they don't mix. So I went back into the studio and then I started writing the other half of it. And then I had an actual complete album with a complete style and a style and, you know, and stuff like that. But it's funny that you say New Way because that's what I was doing yeah. when you were a fantasy. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, also, I just, you know, I don't want to get away from the new album. Okay, The Life and Times of Eddie Gage. So the story. When I'm reading the story, it's like the typical rock and roll story in a way, right? I mean, right? Maybe, you, can you talk about the story without giving away too much? The story is pretty much, uh, well, it's an autobiography. It might as well be called The Life and Times of Al <laughs> that, That's what I thought. I don't want to say it. <laughs> yeah. The story is of this young kid who uh, plays clubs and gets noticed by a big record company exec. But it's also light and dark. I mean, to me, to me, in my eyes, the big record company exec is like a demon. He's not like, you know, so. And then he gets famous and he goes and plays big stages and you know, eventually meets, uh, you know, you know, there's uh, the King of the Sea, which is like the big exec, like the CEO, who's like, you know, Greek tycoon, that's powerful, who introduces him to a woman, and the woman, you know, leads him down the path of drugs. He has like, you know, stuff like psychotic breakdown, and, you know, it gets put, you know, it's, it's just like, it's my life story, pretty much. And uh, yeah. and it ends with, it ends with like a, a Say, say a little prayer, which is a song of redemption, where he's actually happy and he's like uh, spreading his message of uh, faith, hope, and, and love, which is originally what he wanted to do in the beginning. So it's sort of like, a, you know, starts great for him, but everything that uh, the characters that are in it all have uh, different names, like... Uh, Andy Christos. Andy Christos, yeah. That's a Greek guy, right? That's a Greek guy? <laughs> he's yeah. Greek, eh? Yeah, no. On the side, <laughs> but Andy Christos. If you look at the name, Andy is Andy, and Christos is actually Christ in Greek. Yeah, it's yeah. like Andy Christ. So. I'm actually Greek, by the way. I'm actually Greek, so I kind of uh, appreciated that. You figured it out. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's good. All the guys are Greek. Uh, you know, the the execs, uh, the record tycoon, the record tycoon, uh, the, the big CEO of the company is also Greek. You know, but. Uh, as it had nothing to do with that. It's just that the name, I had to find an original name and Christos, which seemed like a name, was actually uh, Greek for Christ. So it's yeah. all to the characters. Which you, got, like, you got a, Adia Rat, Ratti. I'm assuming that's like a Paisan there. Adia, Adia Ratti, is that it? 
Aida Radi is actually, uh, it's a pseudonym for Radi, which is a goddess, an Indian uh, goddess of oh. uh, sex and uh, drugs and sexual pleasure and stuff like that. So it's cool. It's they cool. all have their name, you know what I mean? So every character has a name, but it has a, also a hidden meaning in, you know, in either the Bible or or an Indian folklore or stuff like that. So, I mean, she's the temptress, she's the seductress, she's the said god of lust, god of the goddesses, this and that, in the Indian uh, goddesses. So, I mean, everything has a connotation that's, you can, if I showed you all the names and what they did, you'd go, oh my God, this is like, so, if you listen, read the lyrics, I mean, it's like, uh, the lyrics are really important because that's what, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong lyricist, but they really do tell a story. So, uh, you know, so, I mean, but it'll have a booklet that goes along with it that'll really detail the, the story. The characters will be very, uh, uh, very well defined, you know, so. Uh, so how many characters are we talking about here that you're actually portraying? Uh, actually, there's not many characters that come back. So there's actually a new, uh, there's almost a new character for each song. Some of them do return. Uh, but like in other words, in the uh, story, I'll introduce a character called Anna Foster, which is his childhood sweetheart, and she'll return later in the play. But uh, but it's sung by me, but it's as if in the character of Anna Foster. So you have the history of that, and then you re you realize after that why she sang that song to him. So it's like that. But there's different characters, and there's like a it's 23 songs on the album, and you might have maybe. 19 characters. So. Wow. And again, this is like you said, it's autobiographical. Biographical. I mean, we saw the preview. I got the cassette here of Blood on the Bricks. You <laughs> know? It so that. it's like, it's and, and then of course you went into producing. I mean, it's, it's not like you disappeared. You were still in the music look, business. Look, I right? see it in the background right there. Aldo's a Grammy for a producer right yeah. there. Pick it up. Aldo, bring it. Can you bring it? <laughs> Let's take a look here. Let's take a, Let's see. I want to see a real Grammy. There's a real Grammy. You know what I'm proud of you, Aldo? I'm proud of you because you're a Montrealer and you got a Grammy. Look at that. Look yeah, yeah. at that. Producer of the Year for uh, Album of the Year. Uh, producer for the Album of the Year for Celine Dion, 1994. That's right. That's right. Two it's Canadians right there. Look at that. Two Montrealers. Yeah, but also, you know, here, look, I'm going through the A's. Billy Falcon, Pretty Blue World. You're on that too. You know, I mean, yeah, you, yeah. You, you kept busy. Yeah, that was... Um, that was also, he was only, there was only two guys on, on Johnny's uh, label, yeah. uh, um, Jamco Records, and it was me and this guy called uh, uh, Billy Falcon. And Billy Falcon was an amazing songwriter. And so I played on that, uh, you know, the, you know, if the, if there's the producer couldn't play the part, because one, one time, Billy Falcon has a certain style of playing, but he wasn't good enough to play on the record. But I'm capable of emulating everything. Uh, somebody his, his phrasing, the picking, the style, everything. So they'd call me in and say, well, you, know, you got to play like him. So I played the part. And that's basically, you know, yeah. I, I, I did strings and stuff like that. Let me ask yeah. you, okay, so you're, you're doing this album for 11 years. 12 years. 12 years. 12. Jeez, 12. <laughs> you're doing this for 12 years. So you start at point A, and then after five years, you keep changing things, don't you? Like, don't you have that urge to go back and maybe that vocal is not right? Don't you get into this cycle of, I got to keep fixing stuff? What, what happens? What, what's, what's the mindset here? Well, when I did, I started in 2008, I were already songs. All these songs made it to the final product. They were recorded with drums. I went home and finished them. But the drums didn't sound great. I went to a studio here in Montreal. And... Um, I didn't have my studio built because uh, all the gear was, hadn't come back from Ireland yet and I hadn't set, set it up because I was living in Dublin. I lived there for six years. Yeah. And so I, I had to go into a studio in Montreal, an actual real commercial studio, even though it was the best studio in town. Um, uh, so I went in and I recorded these eight tracks. And of course, yeah, it was only a drummer because that's all I used as drummers. And one thing I can't play is drums. I suck at drums. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I suck. Anyway, uh, so I, I, I hired a drummer, and I played everything else and did all the orchestrations. All the songs appear on the album. Uh, King of Deceit was done in 2008. I did the orchestra. Then uh, waited for a, a while, and uh, 
but uh, like I said, like I said in other interviews, uh, in 2008, I made a conscious decision not to work with anybody else but myself. Um, it was a conscious decision. I got tired of it, so I drew the line. I said, forget it. Uh, even if I have to starve, I'll starve, which I did. You know? so, but I'll never go back to doing anything else. So in 2008, I actually said, okay, I had a vision. I wanted to buy a rock opera. The title came like that, The Life Intends of Eddie Gage. So I wrote eight songs. And then there was a break, and then I started writing more songs in 2011. Then it was another, which I demoed. Uh, I did another uh, couple of songs, uh, like uh, uh, a bunch of songs. Well, Say a Little Prayer was written in 2013. Then I wrote some 2,000 themes, some more. And a bulk of the album I wrote at the end of 2019. The album was actually finished, mastered with uh, 22 songs in it in uh, September of 2019 by Bob Ludwig. Uh, but when I wrote on May 12th, I wrote, I felt that it was missing like one character to actually put it together. And then I wrote when all is said and done, which is like uh, powerful. Single. Yeah, yeah the, the new single, yeah, exactly. So it's very heavy. And the lyrics can be taken a bunch of ways. It can be taken like the God and the devil. It can be taken in my character as a, a lawyer with a judge and, you know, Eddie. So it's, everything is like power, you know. So, so I took a powerful song. And uh, so I called Bob and he mastered it. And I said, well, okay, put it in the album. So to me, since I'm my own record label, I'm my own producer and everything, having 23 songs on the album, at least people won't be able to say that I, I gypped them like on two points. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they've got 20, 20, 23 songs and two hours long. You know what I mean? Oh, and all quality and it's all top notch. I mean, best players, best sound. And getting back to Jimmy's thing, yeah, of course. I, you know, I found my drummer, uh, Lee Levin, in the end, that I found was just like, phenomenal. I mean, you, you send these, and I found a rhythm guitar player called Dan Warner, who passed away in uh, last year. And, uh, I would send, I would do elaborate demos with machines and I would send in these tracks. And the beauty of it, working with guys at your level, is that you, they send you stuff back that you go, my God, this is like amazing. So you, every time I'd hear, every time I, I was waiting for their like Dropbox or, or uh, you know, their files, you know, I would get excited. And of course, they never, they never disappointed me. It would just be like a hundred times better than what I sent them, you know, so... Uh, and so, like and now I'll only work at people at, at the level of musician or whatever the level of uh, record company. Uh, I don't have any record company, but let's say uh, management or uh, a record distributor that's that understands. You know, so I hate friction. I've had enough of it in my my life. I don't like arguing. So just like I didn't like arguing on my first record. Like uh, I wanted this kind of an effect, which I knew was doable. And the engineer said, no, no, you can't do that. So I watched him work for about a week, and he was fired the week after. And I didn't have a job. I mean, I was going to start an engineer. So I'll that's take, so that's about it. Italian yeah. style. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Al Pacino style. Right? <laughs> People used to make that comparison when I was young, that I looked like a young Al Pacino. Yeah, Rolling, you know, Rolling, you know. Rolling, Stone, Rolling Stone said that. The blonde Al Pacino, I remember that was the article. I get the oh, uh, Robin De Niro thing. You know, here, here, we, just, we just had an interview not too long ago with another Montrealer. You know, Frank Marino had his largest album ever with the Juggernaut, leaves the music industry. You know, you're a fellow guitar player, a fellow Montrealer, a fellow Italian-Canadian, and, you know, you kind of got fed up with the music industry too. So that's it. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't need these guys anymore. What is it with the water, Montreal, guitarist, what? What's going on? Everybody's like, screw you. Up. It's not Montreal guys that deal. It's the American guys and all these guys. That, you know, it's like uh, over here, I, I can get a good promo scene. I, mean, I found a great promo scene in La Chasse and Vicky Bonomo that, you know, they don't tell you that the price is like really reasonable. You know what I mean? It's like in the States to get a single promoter, they want $50,000 US and not even get guaranteed that you're going to get on the radio. I mean, it's like, where do you get these numbers? Why do you need $50,000? So I said, I'm going to start in Canada slowly and uh, do it uh, this way and do it my way. And of course, work with great people and, uh, and no friction. Everything anybody understands, you know what I mean? So I don't like arguing. I don't like, you know, get out of my way and 
my way or the highway, but it's not as if, it's just, you know, if I work with people like a great drummer, a great rhythm guitar player, a great, you know, uh, even my band is just like the top of the top. I mean, you know, we just laugh all the time to work together. It's just a, I was talking a bunch of jokers. I mean, you have no sense of humor. You don't belong with me. <laughs> well, how would you describe the musical direction of this album? Is it prog rock? Is it rock opera? Because I'm listening to all the tracks and like, it's kind of like Queen sometimes, the way Queen sort of built their songs, just going off in different time changes and, and, and different, I guess, key changes, I would think. Uh, yeah. How would you describe it? How do I describe this album? The musical direction, yeah. The musical direction of this record is just tells a story. The, every, every song is written around a certain character. So I wasn't, since I was free to do everything, there's some songs like, you know, that are eight minutes long. I mean, I, I didn't have anybody to answer to except myself. So I, I don't care. I mean, you know, a record company would normally tell you, oh my God, you've got everything done. You can't have a song like over four minutes for radio. Every song, like every song, and I, just, I have songs with six, seven, eight minutes. Uh, and they're just like, uh, it could be any style. I don't care. I mean, music is music. But one thing that's, that's common in me and my music is, has to draw an emotion. It can't be sterile. For me, I make music out of emotion. Um, it's got to, you know, make somebody cry. It's got to make somebody laugh. It's got to connect with myself first. And I know that if it doesn't connect, then I will, I'll scrap it. But if I know that if I write something and connects with me and gives me emotion, that, that uh, it'll definitely give somebody else emotion. So to me, the only thing that ties to, with the record is that Every, thought, every song is brought out with emotion. I mean, you know, the vocals are done with emotion, everything. No matter if the style is different, uh, like you said, there's a, when you say that there's a common thread and you know, even if the characters are different, the only thing that's identified is me, even if I change my voice. And that's because the songs are written in the way that you've always heard out of Melba, which is like their emotional song, you know? The songs that I write of emotion. I don't sit at a piano or something and go, oh, well, I'm going to sit today, I'm going to write a song. You know, screw that. I mean, that's not, that's not originality. That's not uh, inspiration. You know, inspiration is inspiration. I'll write a song while I'm driving, which is probably why I'm such a bad driver. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write a song while I'm playing, or while I'm driving, and I'll get the, this riff in my head, and then after that, I'll get a title, and I'll record it on my phone and now i get another right here record that on my songs, phone so by the time i get home i have a whole song and now it's just trying, the hardest part for me is trying to figure out what i have in my head it's like so difficult sometimes what i hear and uh so you know that's that's it and i'll, I'll sit down and finish the song in the night and the lyrics will be almost written like and i'll write them in the car so uh, that's inspiration not written by by uh but there's no, uh, how do I say it, formula. There's no formula in there. Yeah. <clears throat> so the last character, the last song you said was written last night. So how, how is this going to get rolled out? I'm going to release it. Uh, there's either one plan where I release one song every two weeks. So by the time that August next year comes around, you're, you'll still be releasing songs. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean by releasing songs? Like, is this like something people can buy or is it just like on YouTube? Yeah, Spotify I and mean, the songs and it'll be like one song every two weeks and we'll get to keep people like involved and stuff like that. But we're actually working on uh, talks are in, in progress to bring this to a, a huge stage production, which is my essence, which was my dream all along. I mean, that was the whole thing that I started. I mean, I envisioned this as a huge stage production. So now we're talking with a production company that's actually uh, that's actually loves the album and doing that. So for me, it's more important to get that there than to put the record out. The record will make more, more sense. Like I said, there's no time frame. The music is timeless and I don't care. 12 years, I waited 12 years. I wait another 12 years. I don't care. I've got, I don't know if I could wait another 12 years. That's my problem. <laughs> I've, got, I've got nobody on my ass. I don't have what about what about Tim Gaines from Striper, ex Striper, right? I mean, is he is he going to be part of your live crew, or does he help you out, uh, you know, with music, or what, what's his connection there? 
Same games play on Wallace and Dunn. Uh, so it's neat. It's funny how I met Tim Gaines. I was looking at somebody's page on Facebook, and then I saw this guy that still said, you might know. Uh, and then I saw Tim Gaines, and he had a bass in his hand. Hey, I don't know. Something just attracts me. Yellow and black. Uh, <clears throat> no, that's not. He, didn't, he wasn't wearing a yellow and black. He, just, <laughs> he looked like a real bass player. Then I contacted him. And I talked to him, and I said, uh, I sent him the album, and then I said, send me some stuff of yours. And uh, he, uh, he sent me an album, which was a solo record called Bre Breakfast at, at uh, Tiffany's or whatever it was called. Not, not Breakfast, but he said Breakfast at uh, something. And you see it on the cover, just all basses, all, all, all over the seats. So this guy is not a guitar player, not anything. His instrument is bass. He's a bass player. That's what he does. He loves bass and lives for bass. So, and he was a hell of a nice guy. My drummer, Billy Carmassi, I've been playing with him for 40 years, part of the famous Carmassi family of drummers. I mean, he's brother to Denny. He's played with just about everybody. And he's, you see Billy in my fantasy video, you know, so we've been pals. And he's hysterical. So, you know, you know so uh, uh, Mike Bruno from Montreal, who you probably know from the Vikings. Uh, I have uh, Hugo Saint Laurent on there from Montreal also, and that's the band. We have five. We're with me. We're five guys. But like I said, they're all. They have all. They're all. They're all funny. You know. So uh, <laughs> good, good, good. It's nice to hear. You yes. know, Alan. Alan, what was what grade were you in when you first heard Fantasy? What was your initial reaction when you saw the video? Oh, it's just. I mean, you couldn't get it off the radio. You couldn't. You couldn't. You know. I remember the lasers on the guitar. I was probably in yeah. grade seven, I think. The, grade seven or grade eight. The leopard the lasers, skin outfit. The, the, yeah. the, the tiger. What was it? The tiger <laughs> leopard spandex. Skin. Leopard skin. Leopard skin. That was it. You have to understand that. That's. I loved it. Air guitar. Air guitar the whole time. That that that's the, all my idea. Like nobody knew I was going to wear the leopard skin suits. So, <laughs> so, so imagine. I'm 22 years old. I'm 22, 23 years old. I show up. I step out of a helicopter. I come out in a leopard skin, spandex, skin tight suit. I have a Les Paul and I laser down the door. And back then, <clears throat> to do a laser, it wasn't like uh, CGI. Yeah, that's right. You had to have a rotoscope. You just have to draw it on each frame. On the, and so, but still, they did it. And then I showed up with the smoke or whatever. But that was done by Richard Casey. He used to be a B horror movie producer. I mean, he all he used to do was schlock horror movies, but he did a great job with fantasy, you know. So, uh, so uh, that he did that in uh, Ball and Chain, but like it, that was pretty much black and white. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I'm telling you, man, air guitar. Everybody I knew was just playing air guitar to the the solo of fantasy. Yeah, but it's just like there's two things now. Uh, you have to say that I've invented some things that's that. I'm identified with. One is the leopard skin suit, because you just see a leopard skin suit, and people go out and over. The all the things, the other things, I, I, in 1982, I designed uh, a guitar that Gibbs made for me, which was a Les Paul with an Explorer headstock. So you see that, and you say, that's Alvin Nova's guitar. That's the difference between me and a guy like Bon Jovi or any other band. It's like I was really like somebody where, that you can identify music, but you can say, wow, the leopard skin suit, wow, the guitar that's all custom made, you know, subject, you know, which is like completely, uh, uh, like nobody wanted to hear subject, the record company, but like, it's like, <laughs> but I was- Zombie lucky. apocalypse. Yeah, but that's because I was lucky because uh, I, the, the first record I'd done uh, so well that, um, that I did whatever I wanted in the second record, after a second record on subject, I could go, the artwork, uh, everything was done. Um, and so the record, is a subject is really, uh, people are now just discovering subject. It's, it's a great it's, album. Yeah, exactly. It's different. I mean, it's like, it's got, that's prog rock. It's got... Uh, Carl Dixon. Carl Dixon, uh, who wrote to cool, Hey Operator. You do a better version than he does. And that was, you know, that was the, the whole idea. Is that at a certain point, I wanted to produce Corny Hatch. And I wanted to show them what it could be done. They, of course, refused. But then I said, okay, I'll do it. And I said, this is the way the song is supposed to sound. But it's a great rock song. It's a great live song. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you do a great version of it. Uh, what about, and just, just sorry, I just want to, 
is it true fantasy is actually dazed and confused that that but sped up i guess the the keyboard part no dazed and confused is the riff the riff the keep oh yeah 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 a lot of people don't know that I, I overheard that one day and i go i'm not sure i didn't invent anything to say the truth all i do is all i did is like take all my influences and make them a story out of it and then uh you know, this music came out, like I took all the background vocals that I heard out of Boston. I took the raw guitars uh, from the sound from Boston, but I took the big, you know, sound of the, I, instead of doing one guitar, I did two guitars and that gave you like a wall of sound. And then I, you know, I would do the guitar solos, I would trade off and, and then I was fortunate enough to, to, that the record company president uh, introduced me that to, we were mixing the album and with an engineer from Montreal, and it really didn't have any soul, didn't have anything. So uh, Lenny Pizzi, uh, and, and you know, when I went to his house, he used to have these big monitors in his house in his living room, and uh, he made me hear a, a band of his called Balance, and I said, that's the sound that I want. I want my record to sound like that. So he introduced me to Tony Bon Jovi, and Tony Bon Jovi had built the Pirate Station, biggest studio in the world, everybody went, which now is the Avatar also the biggest studio, but it's all Tony's design. He designed the big room that makes the drums sound like cannons. So he took my stuff and he made it sound huge. I mean, you know, I mean, we argued a lot mixing that record. That's why it says Aldo Nova and Tony Banjo in the pit. And then, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, it really says like, and I learned so much from him, and of course, but he learned from me too. I had my own way of thinking, you know? So, uh, but that record, that's why that record sounds bombastic because I owe a lot, of the, a lot of the sound. Otherwise, it would just would have come out as, a, as just a regular sounding album. I don't know if it would have had the impact. No, no, it wouldn't have. It, this, the production today holds up. You know, my vinyl that I have back there, I mean, you put it on, it's, it holds up. It holds up well. Yeah. And I, had, I had guys like Bob Ludwig, you know, who mastered all my records. He's, you know, I had the top of the top, the cream of the crop, you know, doing my stuff. I was 24 years old when it came out. And, you know, the... When you think about it, a guy from Montreal, I'm 22 years old, the head of the a &R who had his own label, boutique label, the guy who signed Boston, the guy who signed Hart, the guy who signed Cindy Lauper after, comes to Montreal and takes me and signs me to a U.S. record deal. I didn't get signed to a Canadian deal. Wow. First. I got signed to a U.S. big a label that where the guy signed Boston and everybody. So... Um, that's, I mean, it was, when I think about it now, I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. You know? so. And I don't know who, who, who was bigger back then in Montreal. I, I don't, like, I mean, okay, Salim came afterwards, right? Corey Hart yeah. was after, but I think, Aldo, I think you must have been the first Montrealer to really break into the U.S. Maybe April Wine, I guess we could say. They're kind of Montreal. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, but um, I, don't, I, I don't know. April Wine did break with, like, Rock and Roller. And she's she's a roll, she's a roller. Yeah, and yeah. And they're a great band, by the way. I mean. Oh yeah, absolutely. Frank too, Frank Marino, but not as big as uh, Fantasy. I don't think so. No, no. They, like I said, Fantasy is considered a classic. I mean, that's uh, uh, today, which I have to admit. You know, you know, I have plaques on the wall. I have some yep. back here. I also have to have a V three back here with a Leslie in case. You see. But that's in my living. I'm in my living room. Oh, wow. Jeez, that's your living room. <laughs> it's, not my, it's not my studio. It's actually, actually, it's my living room. I actually have a, a real B3 with a Leslie in my living room. That's how nuts I am. You know what I mean? <laughs> this thing was 500 pounds. I had to get three guys to move it in here. You're also a comic book collector, are you not? Yeah, I have 75,000 copies. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's, in the, that's in the kitchen. <laughs> I actually have, a, I actually have a, a, an enclosure built just for comics. That's the only Amazing. Amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you, and I'm, I'm going to make this short because I don't want to talk too much about Bon Jovi. I, I was listening to Eddie Trunk, and I think it was Eddie Trunk, and maybe if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. There was no mention. So this is how the sequence of events came. Runaway, and we've talked about this before, right? I just want to clarify this. Runaway was a single that was released by itself with an all-star cast of musicians and you were part of it. 
then, correct? Correct. Did you, you played rhythm guitar and a little bit of keyboards and additional back vocals on it, right? I, I, no, I, I did that, but I also did all the background vocals with him and a guy called the Caseros uh, on the whole album. And I, could, I played keyboards on a lot more songs than I'm giving you credit for. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm getting at. I'm getting at. I think you, there's a lot. You play. You played a bigger role than people talk uh, about when they well, think of Bon Jovi's first album. Well, you know, it's like he's pretty cheap with credits. Instead of going, well, Aldo Nova did this on that song. Aldo Nova, he just said Aldo Nova appears at Perfect Portrait Records. That was it. So it's like, I mean, uh, on my albums, everybody gets credit for whatever. You know what I mean? So. Uh, All right. Uh, I mean, right. If you go to the Bon Jovi. Uh, page uh, that you know you, can, you don't even see my name anywhere in the wikipedia page along with the still in dion you don't see my name anywhere and every band that i've ever produced you don't see my name on the pages at all well that's why you're on this show we're going to make sure we get that out <laughs> get that we're going to make sure everybody knows <laughs> what the I, real deal is i don't give a shit i have an ego i don't have an ego i don't really don't care i mean to me i don't need my ego fed by playing in front of twenty thousand people i'm happy sitting in an italian restaurant telling jokes I mean, you know, <laughs> it's just one guy. I mean, just, I, I'm not a guy. I don't need my ego. It matters to me. It matters to me, Aldo. It just matters to me. That's all I'm going to say. It <laughs> credit where credit is due. It bothers <laughs> me, okay? That's why I want to clarify this. That's all. That's all. All right, let's get back to the new album. Anything else you want to tell everybody about the new album? The new album is, like I said, it's a labor of love. I worked on it hard. Uh, I think it's probably, uh, uh, the critics are going to criticize it, but I think the fans are going to love it. It's going to be totally innovative music. And like I said, some things are going to go, well, it doesn't sound like Aldo Nova. Like when all is said and done, people are going, but when all is said and done, people are going, wow, you, you did take a left turn. You did, uh, you know, change direction. You did uh, stay current rather than doing, you know, fantasy all over again. You know, when all is said and done, it's like a three piece band, no keyboards, no background vocals, just bass, drum, guitar. That's it. You know, so uh, it's a three-piece power trio. So, uh, and then one voice, my voice. So it's completely different and radical, the writing and the one I did before. And, you know, that's, that's who I am. I evolve. Yeah. Alan? Hey, keep your ears and eyes out for these songs as they come out uh, every second week for the next uh, <laughs> 23 next, uh, weeks, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that, that depends because, like I said, we're working on the uh, – and talks for doing the rock opera, so that might change the whole perspective of everything all you know, altogether. Is, now, who is, that, so, is that local? Is that uh, international? Who's uh, who's these people it, there? It's uh, people that are international, you know, and they like flipped on the material. So wow! I mean, the guys like said you should be on a big stage. Guys that get it, um, you know. So uh, so they they've done uh, a lot of things over the world, and so it's again it's not a small scale. So. And what I've, what I've actually done, when I've actually achieved that thing, then my dream will have come true. And then my vision will be complete. That's what I like about you, Aldo. You're a visionary. You're, you're, you're an artist, a true artist. And that, that, that's really cool. That's very cool. Um, uh, actually, my last question was a Blue, Blue Oyster Cult. I just heard a new song by them. And I thought, you know, going back to the day when you, you actually wrote with them, you know, uh, can you talk about that just a little bit? Well, the way that song... Take was it uh, that song take me away take me away that's it it was a song that was a part of my original demos and it was called a cycle ward cycle ward was about a serial killer that escapes from the cycle ward and it was out it was like completely insane but, but pause you have a song called cycle ward on this album too right yeah but that's a second word on this it's, album is about is about uh, an ambulance the guy being put into the ambulance going to the cycle ward. Ah, okay. This was about the guy in the cycle ward that escapes and he's a mad serial killer. And so uh, so uh, I had sat on the shelf for a while. I didn't put it on my album. And uh, then Eric Bloom heard the music because we had a certain, the same manager we had Sandy Perlman. So Sandy gave him the tape and you know the, the music was really, uh, really good. And so Eric says, well, you know, I'll write lyrics and his lyrics fit spot on. Eric's a great lyricist. He's like very visual. He's also into like uh, UFOs and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I'm into also, space age science fiction. So um, 
he wrote Take Me Away, which are about, uh, you know, uh, extra, extraterrestrial to take me away and things like that. So the song works. And I, I had a lot to do with the overdubs, of the production. I mean, I sneak, into, I sneak into the studio at night and like redo the guitars. And we <laughs> I sneak in everywhere. <laughs> I do whatever I want when the fuck I want. <laughs> the Life and Times of Eddie Gage. I'm, I'm, I can't wait till it comes out. From what I've heard, it sounds like a, a great, you know, great bunch of great songs. I mean, well written, well written song. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Jimmy. Yep. And All right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he didn't congratulate you. I did. <laughs> I, I'm talking to Aldo Nova. My day is good here. What, 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 what do you want? You can't leave, leave anybody out of the conversation. You know, it's like the two. All guys, about credit. I'm not just going to talk to one guy. Like uh, ignore the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Aldo. We'll talk again hey. when you have more news and more updates. Look forward to hey. talking to you again. Thank you so much. Hey guys, thank All you. Right. Congratulations, Bye. Mike. Bye. Get